Good afternoon and welcome one and all to the 19th session of research discussion on graphs and groups. I request Professor Ampad Vijay Kumar to introduce today's speaker. I'm extremely excited to introduce Michael Judici, who did his PhD from University, Queen, Mary University of, Queen Mary University of London under the supervision of Peter Cameron. Presently, he's at the University of Western Australia since 2002 and he is now full professor since 2018. He has received numerous awards which include the 2005 Kirkman Medal and 2012 Paul Medal from the Institute of Combinatorics and its applications. He was awarded the 2020 Gavin Brown Prize of the Australian Mathematical Society which, which is a prize that is awarded for an outstanding and innovative piece of research in the mathematical sciences published by a member or members of the society for the past 10 years. It's a very prestigious award from Australia and is also editor at the Journal of Group Theory, Journal of the Australian Mathematical Society and Electronic Journal of Combinatorics and has published uh, more than 70 excellent publications. With this, uh, welcome Michael Gudici for the research discussion on graphs and groups organized by the another Commonwealth country, India. Welcome. Okay, great. Okay, yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'd like to begin by thanking uh, Professor Ambat for the invitation to speak at this um, in your seminar series. Um, despite being only on the other side of the Indian Ocean here in Perth, um, I, I've never actually been to India. Uh, I, ho hopefully I can rectify that at some point uh, once travel reopens. But, um, but it's, it's a pleasure to be able to speak uh, to you today. So I'm going to give a, just a general survey talk about commuting graphs. So I have done some work on commuting graphs in the past, not too much recently, but I thought I'd just give a general survey of, uh, I suppose, some of the results that I've uh, been involved in, but also some of the results that I like in the area. So first of all, um, sorry, right, right. So, what is a commuting graph? I'm sure in this seminar series, perhaps I don't need to have the slide, but for me, I have a finite group G, I look at its center, and the commuting graph is going to be the graph for which uh, all vertices are just the elements of G which are not in the center, so the non-central elements of my group G, and two vertices will be adjacent precisely when they commute. Okay, so that's my uh, commuting graph. I mean, in, in some instances, I don't know, in some, uh, some papers, they allow the elements of the center, but I, I exclude them because they're sort of like uninteresting vertices. They're connected to everything, so we often forget about those. Um, and here's a couple of uh, simple examples. So if I take S3, uh, we're just going to get a, um, a disjoint um, five, sorry, I get uh, three uh, isolated vertices and an edge. Uh, whereas the Q8 and the dihedral group of order 8, you actually get isomorphic commuting graphs. They're just consisting of three edges. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to this example a little bit uh, later on, but there's some simple examples of commuting graphs. Now, these were first introduced uh, in the, I suppose, it's the seminal paper by Brower and Fowler. So in their group um, in 1955 on groups of even order, so they were, um, I suppose this is one of the founding papers towards the classification of finite simple groups. They're bounding the order of a group uh, by the order of the centralizer of an involution. And in that paper, they do introduce the notion of a, um, of the commuting graph of a group. For them, though, all their groups have trivial center. So they only have to exclude the identity element for the vertex set. And they have this nice, interesting theorem, uh, which says that if, uh, the center of the group is trivial, and G has at least two conjugacy classes of involutions, then the distance between any two involutions in the commuting graph is at most three, which I think is, is quite a striking result, okay? In some sense, in the commuting graph, as long as you have at least two classes of involutions, so as long as all your involutions are not conjugate, then your involutions are in some sense are close in the graph, okay? They're always at distance at most three. Now, since then, uh, in commuting graphs have uh, received a lot of attention. Uh, there's been a few variations uh, over time. 
I suppose the notion of whether or not two elements commute is just uh, is not restricted to the structure of a group. And some people have gone on and studied uh, commuting graphs of rings or commuting graphs of semigroups. Uh, we'll see a little bit about semigroups later on. Uh, there's also been a few other, um, I suppose, generalizations. One thing you could do is instead of taking all the non-central elements in your group, you can just choose a nice subset of the elements in your group and study the commuting graph on that subset. Um, one particular instance which has received a bit of attention is what are called commuting involution graphs. And this is where your vertices are all the involutions in your group. And again, commuting involution graphs also made an appearance in the classification of finite simple groups. Because if you go to the work of Fisher on uh, two, three transposition groups, and where he, I suppose, discovered the uh, Fisher groups, then uh, commuting involution graphs make an appearance in his work there. So it's quite, I suppose, serendipitous that in these two different parts of the classification of finite simple groups, commuting graphs made an appearance. Um, they, they also have been widely studied by, there's several papers by Bates, Bundy, Hart, and Rowley and uh, looking at uh, commuting involution graphs for certain families of groups. So I think they look at, uh, I think, like SN and maybe some other Coxeter groups and a few other well-known groups. Um, at the same time, I should mention non-commuting graphs. Okay, so this is the complement of the commuting graph. So I take all the vertices of the, to be the elements of the group. Uh, sometimes you exclude the center again, and but then you have, um, they'll be adjacent if they don't commute, so if they do not commute. And there's an old classic result of uh, Bernard Neumann. Um, he was actually answering a question of Paul Erdosch, and he proved that if I have a non-commuting graph and it does not contain a infinite clique, then there is actually an upper bound on the sizes of its cliques. Okay, so if there are no infinite cliques, there is an absolute constant such that all cliques have size at most that constant, okay, which is also a little bit uh, surprising. And moreover, in such groups, uh, the center has finite index. Okay, so again, some people study commuting graphs. Other people like to study non-commuting graphs. I suppose it's uh, a matter of personal preference, but there's various work on um, all these sorts of concepts. Now, the other thing uh, which is related, which perhaps you've uh, seen in these talks, is you have the prime graph. Okay, so these are introduced by uh, uh, Grunberg and Kegel in 1975, and they originally used to study uh, group cohomology. And the prime graph of a group is just you have uh, the set of vertices and now the prime divisors of the order of your group. And you join two primes by an edge precisely when your group has an element of order, the product of those two primes. So P and Q will be joined by an edge if you have an element of order P times Q in your group. Now uh, that's a very, I suppose, simple graph. You just have one vertex for every prime, but uh, they're actually very uh, related to the commuting graph of a group. And there's a result of by Iran Manesh, A. Iran Manesh and Ali Iran Manesh and Jaffa Zeta in 2008. So it goes back at least as far as that, if not earlier. And if I have a uh, group with trivial center, then the commuting graph will be connected precisely when your prime graph itself is connected. Okay, and so I suppose the key observation there is that if I have a path in the commuting graph, then, well, you could replace each of these elements in the path by an element of prime order in the subgroup generated by that element, and you'll still get a path. And then if two elements of prime order commute, then their product, if one has order P and one has order Q, then their product will have order PQ, and so your group has an element of order PQ. And so then you're um, there'll also be a path between the primes in the prime graph. Okay, so often when you want to study questions about um, the commuting graph, it's quite useful to study the prime graph. Okay, and the prime graph itself has been well studied uh, for many groups. There's a large amount of work being done on studying the prime graph of a group. Now, that's for groups with uh, trivial center. Uh, we could, of course, want to, well, we do want to study groups with non-trivial centers. Okay, so if I let Z be the uh, center of a uh, group, of my group G, well, if I take any coset of the center, then all the elements in that coset commute with each other. So in the commuting graph, if these are vertices in my commuting graph, or they are vertices in my commuting graph, 
So if these are vertices in my community graph, then that's going to give me a clique. Okay, so for every coset of the center, I get a clique in my commuting graph. And moreover, if I have two elements which commute in a group, then every element in their corresponding cosets will also commute. Okay, so in some sense, the commuting graph, we can look at it by just looking at cosets in the center. Um, and again, an observation going back to Vahidi and Talibi in 2010 is that your commuting graph is always the lexicographic product of the complete graph on whose order is the order of the center and the commuting graph on a transversal of Z. Okay, so often when we want to study um, commuting graphs, we just take a transversal of the center and we can look at the, um, the group, the commuting graph of that transversal instead of the commuting graph of the whole group. Okay, and if I can understand the commuting graph on the transversal, then I understand essentially the commuting graph of the whole group. Okay, so that's a very useful um, observation. Now, for on, so one thing I suppose, so a few questions I want to look at for commuting graphs is, um, well, can you recognize the group from the commuting graph, right? So if I give you a commuting graph of a group, can we recognize the group from it? Now, there was a nice result of uh, Ron Solomon and Waldar, I think Andrew Waldar, uh, for 2013, that says if I have a group G, and its commuting graph is isomorphic to the commuting graph of some simple group T, so a finite simple group T, then G must be isomorphic to T itself. Okay, so uh, simple groups uniquely determine their commuting graphs. Okay. But this is not true in general because I gave you an example at the start. Okay, the commuting graph of Q8 and D8, they have their isomorphic, okay, and Q8 and D8 are clearly themselves not isomorphic. Okay, so we, we do need uh, simplicity here in this result of uh, Solomon and, and Walter. Now, I suppose the question is, well, when can the commuting graph of two groups indeed be isomorphic? Um, so let's do a brief uh, detour into isoclinic groups. Okay, so isoclinic groups, again, is another way often used to study P groups. Um, to, so to, it's slightly weaker than isomorphism. And so you have a group G with a center. You have the commutation map where it takes, um, it's the map from G modulo over center across G modulo over center down into the derived subgroup. And so you map an ordered pair, you take two cosets of the center and you map it to the, uh, the commutator of the representatives. Okay, so we have there. And then we say two groups are going to be isoclinic. If you have an isomorphism between their quotients modulo the center, and another isomorphism between the derived subgroups, which commutes with the commutation maps of these two things. So I suppose that's a little bit technical, but essentially it gives you a way of looking at groups. And Q8 and uh, D8, they're, isomor they're isoclinic groups, okay? So Q8 and D8, their centers are uh, of order two. The quotient by the center is C2 squared. So you do have an isomorphism between um, the quotients by the center, their derived groups are order two, so we do get a um, isomorphism between their derived groups, and those two isomorphisms do commute with the um, intertwine. Sorry, with the uh, commutation map. So that's what we mean by an isoclinic group. Now, I mentioned them because uh, Pezot and Nakayoka recently showed that if I have two groups which are isoclinic and they have the same order, then their commuting graphs are isomorphic. Okay, so again, yeah, Q8 and D8, they are isoclinic. Of course, that means, so that means their commuting graphs must have been isomorphic, which we know, but for any pairs of isoclinic groups, you get isomorphic commuting graphs. Now, I did see recently a question someone asked, I think Peter asked in a recent talk, does the converse hold? Okay, so by that, I take it to mean if I have uh, two groups whose commuting graphs are isomorphic, uh, must they be isoclinic? Well, They don't even need to have the same order, I suppose, is the first thing, right? So if I look at uh, this here, so if there's this um, answer by Mohag Adam Farr and Isaacs in 2006, which um, shows that if I have isomorphic commuting graphs, the orders may not, do not have to be um, equal, okay? So um, it's a very nice example. So let's go through their example. So I take a P group, P, of order two to the 10, such that if I quotient out by the center, it's got order, um, it's, it's uh, C two to the five. 
and uh, every non and you can choose a p group of this form such that every non central element for every non central element its centralizer is just the center of p times the subgroup generated by x now since this is the case if i look at the commuting graph of p i just get uh, a disjoint union of 31 copies of the complete graph on K32. Right? So um, that's corresponding, so I have that. Right? So that's what my commuting graph is going to look like. Now, if I take any abelian group A, and I take the direct product of P with A, then its commuting graph is then gonna be just a disjoint copy, sorry, a disjoint union of 31 copies of the complete graph on 32 times the order of A number of vertices. So my new group, P cross A, its center is going to have order. It's going to be the center of P times direct positive with A. And so that's why we're going to get lots of these uh, direct um, copies now. So I've just made, by making my group larger, all I've done is I've just made my cliques larger. I still have the same number of uh, um, connected components. Okay, so that's one group. At the same time, there is a group of order five to the six. Let's call it Q. If I quotient that by the center, I get something which is elementary abelian of order five cubed. And again, for every non-central element X in my group Q, its centralizer is just the center of Q times the subgroup generated by X. This then means that my commuting graph is going to be the disjoint union of uh, 31 disjoint copies of. Uh, this time now, it's going to be, we get um, a complete graph on uh, four times five cubed vertices. So that's my new commuting graph. And then again, I take a Q direct product with any abelian group B. All this does is it just grows the sizes of my cliques again. So I still get 31 copies of, um, now I get cliques of size, the order of B times four times uh, 125. Well, all I then need to do is I just need to choose A and B such that the cliques in this case, are the same order as the cliques in this case. Right? And I can choose the order of A and B so that that happens. Right? So I want uh, 32 times the order of A to be 4 times 5 cubed times the order of B. And once I have that, both of my commuting graphs, the commuting graphs for Q cross B and the commuting graphs for P cross A, they're going to be 31 copies, a disjoint union of 31 copies of cliques all of the same size, that size being this equal number here. Now these two groups, Q cross A and Q, and, sorry, Q cross B and P cross A, they have uh, different orders, so and they don't have to be isoclinic. So um, if I have isomorphic commuting graphs, my groups don't have to have the same order, and they don't have to be isoclinic. I suppose that does still leave open the possibility that maybe if I have two groups of the same order, which have isomorphic commuting graphs. Maybe that implies that they're isoclinic. That perhaps is still um, <clears throat> a possibility. Okay, so that's uh, something about, I suppose, how commuting graphs, perhaps uh, their behavior is not so nice, right? Uh, you can have two different groups of uh, different orders, but they still have the isomorphic commuting graphs. Okay. And so that happens because we're throwing away everything in the center, so then that makes the commuting graphs have at least the same order, and then they can still then be isomorphic. So the next thing I want to look at is um, diameter and bounding the diameter. Okay? So the diameter, that's the, um, the largest distance between any two vertices in the graph. And if you remember back to that original result of Brouwer Fowler, that in some sense was telling you about how far apart uh, involutions can be in the commuting graph. But we want to know about how far apart can any two elements in, a, uh, in the group be, how far apart they can be. Well, um, one result I want to start with, there's an old result of uh, Segev and Seitz uh, from 2002. And they showed that if I have a simple classical group over a field of size at least, uh, or size greater than five, so at least seven, then the commuting graph is either disconnected or it has diameter at most 10. And uh, they also showed if I have a sporadic group or an exceptional group of the type, then um, other than E7, then the commuting graph is also disconnected. So in some sense, they're showing that for most 
um, of the simple groups of the type, your commuting graph is either disconnected or it's got a diameter at most 10. So that's quite uh, striking. Now, they proved this result because together with the Pudenchuk, they used their results about the diameter of the commuting graphs to prove that finite quotients of a multiplicative group of a finite dimensional division algebra must be solid. So that's again, perhaps very surprising, but you know, something about division algebras and uh, the multiplicative group, whether or not it's uh, quotients of a multiplicative group being soluble, um, they're able to convert that to a question about diameters of commuting graphs. So I find that also quite um, you know, surprising and interesting, but again, the commuting graph is appearing in a very, what you'd think to be an unusual uh, circumstance. Okay, so that's one thing. Now, at the same time, or a bit later on, so we, I, we talked about the diameters of um, simple groups of Lie type. Other groups of Lie type, I mean, other simple groups are, of course, the alternating group AM. And so then in the Rand Manesh and Jeff in 2008, in the paper I mentioned before, they show that if I have an alternating group or a symmetric group of degree N, then either the commuting graph is disconnected. Well, oh, sorry, I'll say that again. If I have a n or s n, then the commuting graph is disconnected if and only if n or n minus one is a prime. And otherwise, so in the cases when it's connected, the diameter is at most five. Okay, so again, this is another family of simple groups and almost simple groups where the diameter is bounded by um, a constant. And they conjectured in the paper that there should be some absolute constant d such that for any group, if the uh, commuting graph is connected, then it should have diameter at most d. So I was sent this paper to actually review for math science. So I wrote the review for math science and I saw the um, conjecture. I think when I first saw it, it's like, oh, that, I don't believe that. That can't be, that, that can't be true, that conjecture. Um, but then I started to read around a little bit in the literature and it's like, oh, well, maybe it is. You know, we can't find anything of... Um, large diameter, so maybe there's some hope that the conjecture is true. Um, but motivated by their conjecture, um, Yara Arroyo and uh, Kinyan and Konyes in 2011 showed that for all n, there is a semi-group with commuting graph of diameter n. So we knew that for semi-groups, you could have unbounded diameter. But at the time, I think the largest diameter we knew for a commuting graph, um, well, we had this, um, the, the classical groups, it was the most 10, but I think we actually didn't know anything which actually met the bound of 10. Okay, so we didn't know uh, too many, which had perhaps more than about five, I think, at the time was the largest diameter um, was known for a, for a group. Okay, so then I had a... About this time, I had a student, Aidan uh, Pope, and he was looking to do a summer research project with me. I said, oh, well, let's, we can look at this uh, conjecture and see what, um, what we can say about it. Um, so the first thing I suppose you do is you go at Magma and you look at all the groups of order up to 2,000 at the time, which were in uh, Magma. Um, and except for two groups orders where there's just too many of them to check, we saw that the largest diameter of the commuting graph was, was six. And, uh, and we also gave a um, infinite family of soluble groups which had diameter six. Okay, so this is, we just take a ZP squared extended by an SL2P, as long as P is congruent to one mod three. Okay, and so that there was an infinite family of diameter six. Um, we also showed some nice couple of results about um, certain cases. We're looking at the uh, group modulo the center. And so if the index of the center is a product of at most three primes, we're able to show that your commuting graph must be disconnected. And another one um, is that if, okay, if I have a group with, where the derived group is inside the center, so something which is uh, nilpotent of class uh, two, then, and at the same time, the uh, cube of the order of the center is less than the order of G. So in some sense, the center is small compared to G, then your commuting graph has to have diameter two. And so again, these are some results of uh, this time I'm starting to think, okay, maybe the diameter uh, would be bounded. So, okay. now, we also found uh, there had been some other work and I found that there was this paper by, sorry, I think it was this PhD thesis, sorry, by Woodcock in 2010. 
And uh, he was looking at soluble groups and with trivial center and showed that if we also have all Silovar subgroups that are neither cyclic nor generalized quaternion, then your commuting graph has diameter at most seven. Okay, so that's also bounding the diameter. And this then, Chris Parker in 2013, was then able to, he studied um, soluble groups, uh, arbitrary soluble groups with trivial center and showed that if they are connected, then they have the commuting graph will have diameter at most eight. Um, also determined exactly when the commuting graph will be disconnected. That can only happen for Frobenius groups or two Frobenius groups. And he also showed that it is bound with sharp, okay, which so he constructed an infinite family of commuting groups for which the diameter was equal to eight. So uh, there's the definition of two Frobenius if you're interested. Yes. So then this was actually quite a serendipitous uh, story, this actually, so I, I will tell it. So I think um, Chris, I think, sent me this paper and it was actually sent it to me on a Friday um, afternoon. I said, oh, yeah, that's quite nice. Um, I'll see you next week. Uh, we're going to a conference in Banff together. And uh, so that was, uh, um, that was, uh, I, don't, I don't think he, when he sent it to me, I don't think he realized we were both going to the same conference the following week. So I was about to hop on a plane to fly from Perth to Banff. But also later that day in the archive announcement, there was a uh, paper on the archive by Hegarty and Zelozov. So 2014 is the year it finally appeared. And they gave this probabilistic construction. Um, so they defined this group G, well, a family of groups with two parameters M and K. And this is a group of order two to the M plus R. It's uh, generators, they give M plus R generators. So we have these N elements Z1 up to ZR. Um, <clears throat> they're gonna be in the center of our group and they're gonna generate an elementary abelian group of order two to the R. They have some M other generators, which they'll call M. So the group generated by the Zs is elementary abelian of order two to the R. It contains the derived group and it's inside the center. And then you need to define what the commutator of Xi and Xj is. And I say, well, let's just define what that commutator is at random. Okay, it will be a uniformly random element at H. K is another parameter. They're sort of like trying to work like the erdos renyi random graph model. So they have some parameter. And they showed that the probability goes that the derived group is equal to H is equal to the center, goes to one as M goes to infinity. And they conjectured that the commuting graph for these groups should all, is almost surely connected and diameter k. So up until then, we're all doing these results trying to show that the diameter is bounded. But then they give this family of groups and they say, oh, we think here almost surely this infinite family should have arbitrarily large diameter. Okay, so because you can choose k arbitrarily and these should then give you um, graphs of diameter k. So that's what uh, I head off on my plane trip. It's like a I don't know, to get from Perth to Banff, you have to fly from Perth to Sydney, Sydney to Vancouver, Vancouver to Calgary, then you catch the bus for three hours up into the mountains to get to Banff. It's probably 24 hours um, to get there. Anyway, but that's what happened before I left. So I get there to Banff and we, I see Chris. Anyway, so we discussed their paper and various things. And um, over the course of that week, we had various discussions. And then the following week after I came back to Perth, and then we landed on this construction here. So. I define a new group. What I do is I take two vector spaces, Vm and Wm. They're going to be vector spaces over uh, a field of size two. First, we'll have dimension m. Second, we'll have dimension m minus two. And we take bases for each of them, x's and y's. I need to define a bilinear map from V cross V to W. And so my bilinear map will take xi, xj to this element, y, j take i, take one. And then I define a new group, let's call it HM. It's going to have underlying set VM cross WM. I then have to give the multiplication for it. And really, we're just using our bilinear form to define a twist in the multiplication in the second quadrant. Now, we're, in some sense, we're trying to find explicitly some groups in the, uh, the Hegarty-Zeloff um, sort of like uh, framework which we're trying to land upon with arbitrarily large diameter. 
And we tried many possibilities for what we should put here. And in the end, we just went for one of the simplest ones. Initially, we're putting like products of Ys here, but then eventually we landed on the simple one. And turns out, okay, in this um, direct product of elements, you just identify Xi with the pair Xi zero, Yi with zero Yi. Then our group H has order two to the two M take two. It's got an potency class two. The Xi's and the Yi's are involutions. The center of our group is order consists of all the yi's. We get a group of elementary abelian group of order two to the m take two. And the commutator of xi and xj is just y subscript. Uh, you take the absolute value of i minus j and then subtract one. So this is the group we get. And sure enough, the commuting graphs of these groups are connected for all m at least four, and the diameter goes off to infinity as m goes to infinity. So that shows the conjecture. Um, is false, right? You can have unbounded diameter for commuting graphs of groups. So we're, we're very happy when uh, we managed to manage to do that. Okay. Um, we didn't explicitly work out what the diameter of our um, graphs was. Um, we suspect it has diameter m minus one, and we did check up to m equals sixteen. Okay. Essentially, what we're doing, like we have our construction, we're playing around with magma, you know, constructing. The things and then we got to the stage where all of a sudden we've got this family of groups and for each parameter of m magma kept spitting out the next number but the diameter was growing it was going four five six seven eight nine ten i just kept going one step up at a time i was like yes we've got it we think we've got a uh, infinite family and then we just had to sit down and actually prove explicitly well at least give us a lower bound on the diameter which we we're able to do in the end okay so that was very much then um showing that you could have um unbounded diameter on the commuting graph. Now that's not um, the end of the story though. So our graphs are nilpotent groups. They have very large centers, right? So if we go back, the center is gonna have order two, the center, the order of the center is growing. It's got order two to the m minus two. And so not long after, so again, the dates around this period, the dates here are the dates of publication, but the dates when actually uh, things actually happened is out of sync with the publication dates as often happens. So uh, Luke Morgan, who at the time was a PhD student of uh, Chris Parker's, I think he was just finishing up. He happened to be at the same Banff conference. That's when I first met him. And um, after heading back to uh, Birmingham, they're both at at the time, they showed that if I have a group with trivial center, then the diameter of any connected component in the commuting graph is at most 10. So that probably should have been the original conjecture um, of the Raman Ash and Jaffa scissor because A N and S N and all your simple groups they have trivial center. Okay, and this is saying if you have a group with trivial center, then there is indeed an absolute upper bound on the diameter of your commuting graph if your commuting graph is connected. Okay, so this is probably I suppose what the original intention should have been. Okay, it's really you get bound of diameter when you have trivial center. Um, the work they do, again, prime graphs crops up. Okay, they used work of Williams and Lucido on the connectivity of prime graphs of almost simple groups, so that played an important role in their proof. Um, they also showed that uh, for a non-soluble group, any connected component not containing an involution must be a clique, so that's an interesting um, fact about commuting graphs. Um, also, they give 10 as the upper bound, but their arguments aren't, uh, they don't appear, well, they're not tight, um, the largest known diameter they, um, that we know of, though, for such group is eight. Okay? And this occurs for a Suzuki group, um, the automorphism group of the Suzuki group, um, Suzuki 2 to the 5. So that's Suzuki 2 to the 5 dot 5. So I think it would still be interesting to see if eight is the correct value for the upper bound here, right? So we know none of diameter nine, we know none of diameter 10. Uh, five is the best possible. Um, very recently, either, I think it was this year or last, no, I think it was this year it appeared in the Journal of the, no, in the Bulletin of the Australian Math Society. Um, Beaky, Carlton, Costanzo, Heath, Lewis, uh, Lou, and Pierce. They were able to extend um, Morgan and Parker's result to not just needing um, that the centre is trivial, um, they showed that the diameter will be at most 10 if the centre intersects trivially with the derived subgroup. So that's uh, quite nice. So they have there. Um, they also extended uh, 
Parker's result for soluble groups. So Parker soluble groups, his upper bound of eight was for when the center was trivial. They also give that upper bound of eight as long as the center intersects trivially with the derived group. And so that's a nice extension. Um, I also want to mention one more theorem of Morgan and Parker in their paper, which is also a little bit uh, striking. And that is that if you look at the commuting graph for your group, then your group G acts by conjugation on the commuting graph. Okay, and if I look at the orbits of G on the connected components, then for a group with trivial center, you get at most six orbits, and equality only happens if your group is J4, okay, which I think, again, is quite, um, quite striking, striking there. Okay, so that's um, essentially the story about the diameter of commuting graphs. Um, however, I did want to mention an open problem. So I think we have this dichotomy Right, we're between the Morgan and Parker result. If we have trivial center, the um, diameter is bounded. Whereas we have our examples with um, Parker and myself, which gives unbounded diameter, but to get an unbounded diameter, the center has to grow. And so I suppose the question, which um, would be natural to ask, is is there some function f of d such that if the order of your center is at most d, then your commuting graph has diameter at most f of d. So for example, f of one would be 10, right? So it's true when d equals one. Um, but beyond that, we don't know. Um, given the recent results by Beeky et al, potentially we should be bounding, um, maybe d should be the upper bound for the order of the derived group with z of g. So either this here should be z of g, the order of z of g should be at most d, or maybe the order of the derived group intersected with the center should be at most d. Okay, but I think that's, that would be an interesting question. If somehow we could tie the, um, the diameter of the commuting graph with the order of the center of the group. Okay, um, so the next um, theme I want to look at is, well, which graphs are commuting graphs, right? If I give you a graph, Okay, give you some finite graph. Can you construct a group which has that as its commuting graph? Now, um, Boyan Kuzma is a Slovenian mathematician, so we looked at uh, this question. And, well, first of all, we showed that if I have, again, go to the semi-groups, every graph on at least two vertices with no vertex adjacent to all the others is the commuting graph of some semi-group. Okay, that was, we just take the graph, say it's on n vertices, we just define a semi-group with n plus two elements, we just introduce a zero element and an extra element z, um, and then we just define how multiplication needs to work on that set of elements, and define it in a way such that the commuting graph of your new semi-group is just the graph in question. So that's, um, again, semi-groups very straightforward. Um, that also, I suppose, gives you an alternative proof of the original result of Arroyo and all, because since we can find a graph of arbitrary diameter, then I can construct a semigroup, uh, which has that commuting graph, um, has that graph as its commuting graph, and that will have arbitrary um, diameter as well. Uh, earlier though, if we're not wanting to restrict ourselves to um, the whole group, uh, Thomas Pazansky, another Slovenian mathematician, showed that if I have any graph on n vertices, it's an induced subgraph of the commuting graph of a group S3, so the symmetric group S3 to the n. So I take n copies of S3, take their direct product, okay, and then inside that group I can find a subset such that the induced subgraph on that subset is my graph that I was after. Okay, and it's quite a simple construction. We just, okay, if I label the vertices of my graph from one up to n, then uh, if I map the vertex i to the n tuple, which has the three cycle, one, two, three in position i, you will have one in all the positions which are adjacent to i, and I'll have one, two in all the other positions. So this is gonna give me a subset of S3 to the n, and then the subgraph induced on that subset is just the original graph that we had in question. If the subgraph of the commuting graph of S3 to the n on that uh, subset is the commuting graph in question. So any graph 
can be an induced subgraph of our commuting graph, of some commuting graph. Um, however, if we want our commuting graph to be our graph to be a commuting graph of a group, of the whole group, then things are much more restricted. Okay? So for example, the smallest connected commuting graph has 30 vertices. Okay? Every connected graph on less than 30 vertices cannot be the commuting graph of a group. Um, and this is the commuting graph I take an extra special group, uh, 2 to the 1 plus 4 um, of plus type. Uh, equally, there's been some various work looking at um, commuting graphs with various uh, properties. And independently, so Afkami, Faruqi, and Kash Manish, and Dasa Nongxiang showed that only 17 groups, they give you explicitly the list, so I decided not to write them down here. Uh, only 17 groups have planar commuting graph. Okay, so if we look at all the planar graphs, uh, only 17 of only only 17 groups can have a planar graph. And then the same paper does in Nong Xiang. Um, they show that the only groups with a triangle-free commuting graph are S3, Q8, and uh, D8. And they also show that for a given genus G, there are only finitely many groups whose commuting graph has genus G. Uh, the two papers, they also looked at uh, which groups can have uh, toroidal commuting graphs, so the commuting graphs in beds on the torus. Um, but I haven't mentioned here that the two lists of groups they give are a little bit different, so I'm not sure I haven't gone to try and match up what the correct list should be, so I haven't mentioned here what, the, what that should be. And so there again, right, it's quite restrictive as to what commuting graphs could look like. Um, and on a similar theme, uh, John Brittle and Nick Gill, they studied the structure of groups with a perfect commuting graph. Um, they get some quite restrictive uh, information for what the group has to look like. Um, maybe you prefer strongly regular graphs. Okay, and recently again, Tezot and Nakaoka showed that your commuting graph will be strongly regular, precisely if it's a disjoint union of complete graphs, and they give you exactly what the parameters need to be. Okay, so this graph has order MS, so MS must be the number of vertices in your commuting graph, so that's the number of non-central elements. And uh, S is this parameter here, so you take the index of the center in the centralizer of an element, take one, and um, times the order of the center. Okay, and that has to be the case for all X in your group, all the non-central X. Okay. So again, not many strongly regular, well, no, no connected strongly regular graphs appear as commuting graphs of groups. All right, so it's quite restricted what a commuting graph should look like. Um, and a little bit, um, so Boya and Kuzma and I did a little bit, again, also trying to pin down what uh, graphs can occur. So we thought, well, that's what happens if your commuting graph has an isolated vertex, and um, we get some restrictive information about what the group has to look like. Right? Your center of your group will have to be trivial, all your isolated vertices are going to correspond to involutions. Your non-isolated vertices, together with the identity, they must form an index 2 subgroup of your group. Um, and then some element outside of your index 2 subgroup N must then act fixed point freely on N, which then means your group N is abelian and G acts by inversion. Okay, so just having a, um, an isolated vertex in your commuting graph strongly restricts what your group must look like. Okay, it's essentially just an abelian group extended by inversion. And that also then means that your commuting graph itself, once you have one isolated vertices, you've got to have your order of G on two isolated vertices and the remaining vertices will form a clique. So that's what we have um, there. Right? And that does match up with, I suppose I gave you, the first commuting graph I gave you was the graph for S3. Okay? Um, that had three isolated vertices, that was half the vertices in S3, and then the remaining two vertices did give you an edge, so that's the clique, so that's what happens, what happens there. And then finally, well, we moved on from isolated vertices to isolated edges, and for these uh, groups, if we have such a graph, the center is order at most two. Uh, either the subgroup generator of G will be self-centralizing of order three, or the group generated by GNH is self-centralizing order four. We then used some big uh, group theory results of various famous uh, uh, <coughs> group theorists, Spike Thompson, Mazarov, and Wong, to determine the structure of a group. 
had to be quite restrictive, but then from that we could then work out what the commuting graph actually has to look like. So again, once I know there is an isolated edge, then your commuting graph just consists of isolated edges, cliques, and at most one non-complete connected component of diameter at most five. So again, right, they're very restrictive what commuting graphs can look like. You just take, um, just having one isolated edge tells you that we've just got lots of edges and cliques and um, one, there's only one non-complete connected component and that has quite small diameter. And at that point, I wanted to finish there. So thank you very much. Can I um, just make a comment, please? Uh, so yes. Michael, just, just to say that uh, when you uh, mentioned that conjecture about uh, uh, that perhaps groups with isomorphic commuting graphs are isoclinic, we were thinking of the commuting graph with, on the whole group, not just on the group minus the center, which is equivalent to saying that the groups will have the same order so it's uh, uh, right. Yes. exactly escaping from that uh, that little trap that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you yes. Okay, uh, yes. I don't know whether this is true or not, but uh, Arvind and I looked at it a bit, and we have the beginnings of some results about that. And in particular, right. I have a feeling that it might be true for groups that are nilpotent of class two. Ah, right. Okay. Yes. Because essentially the. Um, commuting graph to a set of pairs it's in some some vague sense the kernel of the um map from g over z cross g over z to g dashed and so if you've got a map and you know it's kernel trouble is it's not a homomorphism but uh, uh that's that's the uh, basic uh philosophy behind the conjecture right yes okay right so yeah, that's why I think that's it. If you, if you add in the condition that the order of the groups are the same, I think that probably... Well, that I mean, I would be interested to, to see a counterexample because it yes. does seem too good to be true, but uh, I don't yeah. have a counterexample at the moment. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, yeah, no, I think that's right. Because if you throw in that the order of the groups have to be the same and they have isomorphic commuting graphs, Yes, by, my definition, that's the conjecture. Yes. Uh, and also with the definition with where you throw in the center, then that's, um, yes. yeah, then that would then be isoclinic, would still be, uh, yeah. Well, at would least that's what we think yes. perhaps yes. might happen. Yes, no, that's right. I think, cause okay. that's, I think that's it, because once you once you force the groups to have the same order. I then would, things like, get a lot simpler, yes. Yeah. Things get much simpler. You remove all these like degeneracies or numerical <laughs> accidents, which Absolutely. can happen. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Yep. Yes. yes. Okay. So thanks for the very really nice talk, Michael. Thank you. Oh, any other questions? Uh, just, uh, I would like to know that, uh, uh, as you mentioned, the uh, commuting graph is connected if and only if uh, the uh, prime graph is connected. Am I correct? Uh, as long as the center of your group is trivial, you need the center to be trivial for your group. Um, I, I the, don't... Connectivity, the connectivity of uh, commuting graph, if and only if, uh, uh, yeah, phi of yeah. is connected. Yes. Uh, are, there, are there any other property of this kind? Because the graphs are not isomorphic. No. No, the graphs are isomorphic. Well, the graphs are far from isomorphic. Yeah, yeah, far yeah. Far yeah, fewer yeah. vertices. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for but, prime graph. Connectedness is being equivalent. Right. So, in, in any other property of this kind or with any other graph? Sorry, where you've got two different sorts of graphs and they're connected if and only if mm. the other's connected. Mm. Is that your. I'm not sure what the question actually is. Ah, so you, you see, th this is connected if and only if uh, gamma of G is connected if and only if I of G is connected. Yes. Is, is there any other property of this kind? Oh, a property that uh, the, the commuting yeah. graph has if and only if a prime yeah, graph. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, right. Um, I don't know, maybe Peter is probably the person to ask answer that. Well, <laughs> we have some results that connect the prime graph with various other graphs. For example, the power graph is equal to the enhanced power graph if and only if the 
prime graph has, is a null graph, has no edges. This is this yeah. is fairly easy to prove. And we have some other yeah. things along those lines yeah. as well. Fine, if you fine. look in that big long paper of mine on in the International Journal of Group Theory, you'll find some results about that. Fine. Thank you. I have a related question. Um, again, connected to the prime graphs and commuting graphs. Could it be that the diameter of the prime graph somehow bounds the um, diameter of the commuting graph? Or is there some relationship between the two? Ah. Yes, that, that's true because the prime graph is contained in the commuting graph. Okay. okay. Right. So Every edge of the prime graph. Does it upper bound the diameter it of the commuting upper, graph? Yes. If the prime graph is connected, then the commuting graph must also be connected and can have no larger diameter because okay. you're just adding in more edges. Okay. Okay. So, it, so that tells us that it should be somehow logarithmic at most, even if it grows, it is at most logarithmic in the size of the group because the number of distinct prime devices is, yes. is at most logarithmic in the size of the group. Uh, indeed, uh, indeed. Uh, oh, um, but, but you do have the issue, though, that, like, so my examples with unbounded diameter, they're just two groups. So your prime graph is not very interesting. It's just... Uh, <laughs> just a single vertex. One vertex with a two in it. Yes. So that's not... So the, so the diameter of the commuting graph is not bounded by the diameter of the prime graph? Or? No, no. No. Okay. But in fact, what Grunberg and Cagle proved in this unpublished manuscript in 1975, one of the things they proved is a classification of groups for which the prime graph is disconnected. Ah, okay. Yep. They're either Frobenius or two Frobenius, or else uh, essentially a simple group with a bit on top and bottom. And uh, subsequent authors worked out which simple groups can occur there. There's a lot of work on this in. Uh, Novosibirsk. Yeah, that's right. So they, they also, there's lots of work there looking at um, when a group is uniquely determined by its prime graph. For example. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Oh, and so. in, in uh, Yekaterinburg as well. Yep. Yes, I have a paper with Natalia Maslova about uh, things related to that. Yes. Well, there, there was a paper on the archive appeared last week by uh, Melissa Lee and Tomasz Popio, so they're former Perth people. Uh, yes, I think yes. In the last couple of sporadics, I think, working out, uh, showing that they were uniquely determined by their prime graph. Okay. Uh -huh. Yes, what our result says is that there is a function uh, such that if a prime graph has, uh, on n vertices, has more than f of n groups, then it has infinitely many. Ah, right. And our, poly, our function is polynomial degree seven, which is surely not best possible, but it was the best we could do. Oh, but still polynomial, having a polynomial function is... Having it's polynomial, yeah, that's, sure, that's, sure. That's, uh, yes, I like some functions these days. Are often <laughs> triply yes, absolutely, yes. Anything, any other comments, please? So one more quick question, the, yeah, uh, the random graph construction that you showed. Uh, yep. There's something that I was missing there, the GM, GMK. Uh, yes. Yeah, I didn't say what K was. So K is just a parameter. Um, but so K is independent of R and M, is it? That's right, yeah. So K is just a parameter that you throw in, and they're conjecturing that almost surely the graph you get will have diameter K. I see. And so, it's sort of like a little bit how the Erdos Rennie random graph construction goes as well. They have this parameter k as well, and their graphs also, I think, have diameter, almost surely meant to be diameter k, I think. Okay. So before we come to the formal word of thanks, um, I shall inform you that the, the group discussion ends on August 11th with a concluding lecture by Professor Peter Cameron. That will be followed by a closing ceremony for about 15 minutes. So next week we'll start at 5.30 and uh, after the talk by Professor Cameron, we'll spend another 15 to 20 minutes how to follow it up. One of the plan is to compile the, all the lecture notes
delivered by 20 speakers. So I've written to the speakers to give them the PDF for tech files. So we'll compile it uh, after minor editing and all that as a uh, department uh, publication, which will be communicated to all those who are interested in this type of uh, work. That is our major plan. And we will evaluate uh, this program during the concluding ceremony. And uh, I invite now uh, Professor Avarna to propose a formal thanks. And So uh, I, I take this opportunity to formally thank Professor Michael Gudishi for your valuable time and wonderful presentation. As Professor Ampat Vijayagumar had already mentioned, the last session of RDGG will be on August 11th at 5.30 p.m. So see you all then. Once again, thank you all.